let me welcome you and i'm great to see people here from around the world there's also one a colleague here i see from korea a very good morning a good day a very good evening to everyone around the world um, i welcome you and let me also wish you a happy new year a happy new year 2021 i think we're still in january we can still say so um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first WWA webinar in 2021. Um, well, it was, I think, a year ago we held another webinar on small wind at the time when we did not know that that was kind of a trial for the remaining year because that was specifically for small wind like now. But because of the pandemic, we as an association, a global association, had to completely switch all our activities to online. So in the meantime, we had uh, many webinars on many different topics, markets around the world, on training, education, on community energy. And I think it was a very successful year in this regard in 2020. And it's my great pleasure now, and I think it's a very nice, maybe not coincidence, that we start again the year 2021 with this webinar as a workshop on small wind. A topic that is very important for us as World Wind Energy Association and uh, um, very important for us that we can also bring the topic small wind to the international level and to the attention of those people who are dealing with renewable energy deployment on the global level. Uh, welcome on behalf of the World Wind Energy Association once again. Um, before I hand over to my colleague Sean Daniel Pitilou, who will moderate uh, this workshop. Uh, let me just uh, uh, inform you that we would request you to stay muted uh, as long as you're not a speaker and request to speak. I would also um, uh, mention that this webinar is recorded, so we may publish uh, recordings of the webinar like we've done with the previous webinars as well and publish on our YouTube channel. So if you uh, want to say something, please be aware that people from different parts of the world may listen, may uh, uh, hear what you say. But of course, I think most of you will be rather uh, pleased about such opportunity. So with this, uh, welcoming everyone here, in particular our speakers, and now I hand over to my colleague, Sean Daniel Pitelou, who works with me here in Bonn. And uh, he is in charge of our small wind activities and always also behind the scenes, taking care that our webinars work well. Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining this event on Small Wind. Um, first, before we start, I see some names that I don't recognize from previous from, from previous uh, webinars on Small Wind. So, just to let you know, we are an, uh, the World Wind Association. We are an umbrella organization, not only for Small Wind but also for Big Wind. And uh, we have been active in Small Wind since 2012 with different activities and different reports and also uh, online platform we have so any any questions you can also contact us for for big or small win so very briefly also i want to show you what is the for those who are new i see some people from the solar energy business or industry here so what is the the current status of the small win uh, worldwide you can see here what is the, the where are the main markets uh, globally you can see China, US, Italy, and UK are the major markets in terms of total capacity, followed with Van German, Denmark, and then more countries that we know they have installations, but we don't really sure about the number. But uh, you can find more information about this in our previous webinars, where we, we will find presentations about the small wind markets from different regions. So I recommend if you're interested to know more about the market, if you are not really into small wind still, you can check up our small wing website or our main website for webinars, previous webinars, so you will find more information about this. So getting into this uh, workshop or meeting of a small win. So the main idea of these workshops we are starting to organize this year is to, to get an idea about what is the status of small wind regulations and also policies like incentive policies. So we can prepare together with the whole small wind community, a set of guidelines or about the regulations and incentives. So we see in many countries where you have maybe the incentive, but the regulations are not really in favor of small wind or the opposite where you don't have 
uh, in places where you have good regulation, but then you don't have any incentive. So we, what we want to do is try to, from the association, from the international level, try to have some uh, guidelines uh, about how these regulations can be that can benefit the community in terms of safety, but also the industry that makes sense also for the industry. So we want to bring together people from, from the industry, like manufacturers and also some consumers or NGOs. Uh, so, so we kind of harmonize everybody and then try to bring up some guidelines. So the idea of these workshops will be to, to hear from experts and from different regions uh, to kind to collect the information so we can hear in the secretariat together with with all the or, or collaborate collaborate with the organization and try to bring some material that can be then uh, sent out to all these policy makers around the world. Uh, so today we are as a first workshop we will try to to cover more or less the the, the regulations part everything related with building permits or everything that you need to to make the installation in some place. So some of the topics uh, I listed here, you can see in the present in, in this slide, are building permits, everything related to where it's located and uh, and how the system should be organized in the in the area. Then some compliance in terms of electrical, and then also some installations or insurance, anything else. So we the, the plan or the agenda is to hear from some of the speakers already here from US and, and Sweden and Germany try to hear from them uh, what is the situation and also what is their opinion about what can be done or what can be changed so we can have better better regulation for small wind. Uh, I mean, from my, my opinion that I'm, I'm not a expert, full expert on small wind or, or this, but I see in some places some regulations that really don't make, doesn't make sense or, or, or at least it's not clear what is the point of having that in the regulation. Also, when you compare regulations from the same area, I mean, places that are separated one hour, maybe by car, and you see a big difference in the regulation. So, and there's no clear explanation of why is that in that case and why not. So, so there is to, to kind of hear from you more or less what is the situation, what are the main problems and what can be done. And then with all this information, plus the information I get from, from after this meeting, uh, we will try to work something out and then ask you also for a con like a kind of consultation so you can also check whatever we are writing so you can also give your input on that. So I will not take more time because we only have one hour. So I will start, uh, I will now give the floor to Mike Berge from US. So he will have a short presentation about the situation in the US. So I will stop my screen now. And um, Mike, you should be able to put your screen now and to unmute yourself. Yeah, now we see your screen. You see the screen, okay. Very good. I'm trying to, there we go. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, Gene, you, you said uh, we're going to cover all of the details of, of regulations, but you know, it would take two, three hours per country to do that. Um, we don't have that time. I'm going to give a, a very uh, quick overview of highlighting some particular issues that are important. Um, and here in the US, we, we, we call regulations red tape and it's not a, a they're not popular, I guess not anywhere, but um, we, we certainly have, are good at uh, establishing red tape and regulations. So let me give you um, a quick overview of the landscape for, for regulations and, and required certifications uh, in the US uh, currently. Uh, so if you're a turbine manufacturer uh, and you want to get the federal subsidy, the currently 26 to 30% federal tax credit, which is important to the small wind turbine market, then you need to certify your wind turbine. Uh, and um, we now have uh, both a certification uh, standard for the wind turbine itself based upon the IEC standard, but it's a national standard. Uh, and we also have a, a, a new underwriters laboratory electrical safety standard uh, 6142 that the our building permit rules require certification to that standard now as well. Um, also, if you have a system with an inverter or it's an induction system with some other type of controller, uh, you do need to have it certified to the 
um, uh, safety standards um, of uh, I I I E or uh, or under underwriters laboratory, and uh, so in in that regard, and this is going to be required by the utility to to get permission to inter inter tie with the grid uh, for a behind the meter application. Uh, that standard, the, uh, the safety standard, is has is being has been upgraded, and now uh, more jurisdictions are requiring a more sophisticated controls, back and forth controls, so the utilities can actually uh, control your inverter, uh, and that is the 1741-SA, and it's a more complex um, uh, standard and certification. In, in addition to these, um, to the uh, turbine and the inverter uh, certifications. If you're not an ISO 9000 certified manufacturer, then you're going to have annual factory production control audits. Uh, if you are certified to ISO 9000, uh, you're going. I think it's a three-year. Uh, they'll audit, provide an in-person audit every every three years. So so now you have your turbine and inverter um, certified. When you go to install, there's a number of regulations you, and requirements that you have to meet. So in, in each jurisdiction, and there are a lot of jurisdictions in the US as we'll see, um, you're required to get a building permit. Uh, and that will come from either the city or the state, uh, excuse me, the city or the county. Um, there are no federal overriding um, uh, standards. And there's just a lot of variation in terms of tower heights, uh, setbacks, um, uh, analysis required, but just about every single jurisdiction is going to require a professional engineer certified or stamped, as we call it, uh, a, a structural analysis to the wind zone loads for that area. Uh, and in some cases, seismic loads, for example, in California. Uh, and so that'll be required for your, for your building permit. And the standard that they draw on for, for uh, structure is the International Building Code uh, section, uh, EIA 222. The latest version is, is G. Uh, it's updated every so often. Um, so you'll have to have that analysis stamped by a local professional engineer to get your permit. Uh, then there'll be an electrical inspection. Uh, and so they're going to make sure that your wiring meets the National Electric Code. And there's a specific section of the National Electric Code that deals with small wind requirements, 694, but there are also a number of other sections that deal with all, all aspects of, of electrical safety in the wiring. Um, and then, uh, and, and these are costs that are, are borne by the, by the customer uh, through, the, through the installer. Uh, and um, the, um, then the utility will, uh, uh, will require that uh, uh, safety standard on the, uh, on the inverter. So let me highlight two particular problems, uh, uh, significant problems. There are many, of course, but uh, two stand out in my view. One is the cost of equipment certification. So uh, the turbine has to be satisfied, uh, certified, as I said, to two standards, one performance and safety, um, and then one to um, electrical safety. And so you're looking at approximately two, over $200,000 to do that uh, correctly. Uh, it can vary, maybe you can get away with half of that, maybe it's another 50% higher, but these are, the, these are the averages, which is a, a significant barrier. Uh, the inverter also, um, if you're to the older standard, uh, probably $100,000 and, uh, and to the new standard, probably $150,000. So obviously we're all in the wrong business. We should be in the standard certification business because that's where the money is. But anyway, we're, we're stuck with this. Um, and then the other thing is the uh, building permits. So in the US, there are 25,000 zoning jurisdictions. There's no statewide or federal permitting rules other than the FAA heights restrictions around airports. Uh, and so in every jurisdiction, there are different um, limits um, and, and particularly tower heights limits. And a, a particular uh, systemic problem that we have in the US is that most zoning ordinances have a, for residentially zoned properties, most homes, whether they've got a quarter of an acre of property 
or 150 acres of, of property have a 35 foot height restriction. So therefore, here in the US where we have trees that are 80, 90, 100 feet tall, you have to have tall towers in most places. And so you have to go in and get special permission, which can mean public hearings, a lot of costs, a lot of time for the installer, and it's a, it's a real barrier. And then another one, uh, it's just annoying as an engineer, I find this very annoying that we've got, pe uh, that our unions have required an individual uh, for each state um, you have to have a professional engineer license in that state uh, stamp or approve the foundation and, and tower plans, even if they don't know anything about it. Um, in fact, in some states, architects can, can do the stamping, but you, you, you're required to do it and it just raises unnecessary costs in my view. So um, over the years, our trade association, DEWEA, Distributed Wind Energy Association, uh, has been working to try to reduce the barriers, of course, because it's a barrier, these are barriers to the market. So, so we have um, recently um, uh, uh, provided an, uh, a new addition to our turbine certification standard designed specifically to reduce the costs and time involved. And, and some of you saw that, uh, I gave a presentation at the Polk Center uh, meeting a few months ago. Um, also between 2010 and about 2017, um, do we, uh, through various committees that we had, did a tremendous amount of work on, on um, materials relating to permitting and zoning. And those materials are archived at the DeWea website and available to anyone. And so there are fact sheets, there's model ordinances, there's backgrounder guides. And so um, there's many, many, many things there that, that, that you may find helpful. We haven't been able to do much on that uh, recently because the industry has gone through a lot of changes and the um, previous Trump administration was not supportive of the Department of Energy supporting that work. Uh, but it's a new day and we, we expect that um, we'll have support from the, from the Department of Energy to work on what's called soft costs. Um, this is something that this whole basket of barriers and, and regulations and so we expect over the next couple of years to, to make some efforts, whether they'll be substantial or not, uh, I, I don't know, we'll try. Um, and finally, let me just uh, point out that if you wanna find out uh, more about the American market and meet uh, potential uh, resellers and installers, a very good place to do it is at the DeWea National Conference, um, which um, we will have in September, hopefully uh, uh, travel restrictions will be, uh, will be opened up by then. It's in the Washington DC area. Um, and um, we'll have both a workshop, uh, our business conference, and uh, we uh, also go up on Capitol Hill and, uh, and, and lobby. So uh, if you'd like more information on that, just send a request to info at distributedwind.org. With that, um, I'll go ahead and pass it on to the next speaker. And I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mike, for, for the overview. And uh, before we continue, I will uh, ask people that, uh, they, well, this is a meeting that you can actually participate, you can talk. So if you want to do it, you can write in the chat uh, and we will give you the, 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 we will open the microphone or you can hey, uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'm not sure where you will find it, but it's somewhere where you go to, to participants, should be somewhere there, a button you can click to raise your hand. So with that, we, we will know that you, you want to, to make a question or you want to also comment about anything in your country or about what the speakers say. Uh, so I have a question, Mike, uh, regarding the, the building permits and zoning. Uh, have you found uh, in the US any, any particular uh, county or city that, that you think is have the best, let's say regulation on that so we can use this as an example for, for because I see in, in some places they kind of copy, or they you That's know right. they, they they see other you know other neighbor that is, they have the ten meters high so they use the ten meters high but maybe they don't know but have you found like okay this is a good and somewhere in the U S that you see okay this is a good example of how this should look like so it has worked we have we have been able to make installations and uh, there are no problems so do you, do you have any example? So I would point to a. Um... Uh, 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 a law that we, we managed to get passed in California, which directs um, counties and cities um, with certain limitations 
um, that um, they have to they have to provide a permit if a if an installation meets certain minimum requirements. And so in, in that regulation, it, it addresses noise and setback and tower height and uh, 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 electrical safety and a number of, of the issues that uh, most most uh, jurisdictions are, are interested in. And we set reasonable um, uh, requirements. And I think that that serves as, as a good model. I believe it was uh, AB7 and uh, AB425. I, I'd have to, uh, yeah. it's been a few years now, um, but I think that's a, that's a good template. And I think some of that information is on the DeWea website in the resources area. Okay, yeah, we'll have a look. I, 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 already, I already actually looked to some of the, 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 the documents you prepare in the past. Also, when uh, at the American Wind Energy Association many years ago, they have also some kind of guidelines. Uh, but uh, another question is, uh, I mean, you have through DWA, you, you, you have approached, let's say, policymakers, uh, you do lobby. Uh, so what would be your recommendation on approaching, let's say, a county or a city regarding reg uh, building permits? I mean, how do you approach them? Uh, according to your experience, what have been like the, the best way to, to do that? Well, so uh, generally, um, that's not done until there's a customer that's trying to get a permit. So with 25,000 jurisdictions, of course, we can't uh, go and try to change all of the zoning regulations. Um, but when there's a customer and they, there's no previous experience, then, um, you know, it's typically falls on the burden of the dealer to contact uh, the, the local jurisdiction and get get them educated and 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 try to get the uh, the permit. Uh, sometimes easy, sometimes very difficult. Um, you know, we have NIMBY problems with small turbines, like like you have with with large turbines. Uh, but it's um, um, what we if there's a an important market state like California, sometimes the industry comes together and tries to do something on a statewide basis. Um, California is the only example we have so far, but, you know, hopefully within the next few years, there'll be other examples of that. Okay. Okay. I will come back to you later for maybe a more specific question. I will, I will like to pass to the next speaker to, to Sven Ruin from Sweden. So I know he, you want to bring up some information about the European directives that might have an impact on small wind imports mainly no, in, in Europe. So Sven, uh, I will open now your microphone. And yeah, you should be able now to to, to, to. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Now I uh, should be unmuted and um, uh, let me go to share my screen here. Uh, so I made a, a short presentation here uh, because I thought in a workshop we should probably have enough time to discuss things, but um, I thought I could perhaps trigger some interesting discussions by presenting this uh, view of the regulator regulatory framework we have here. So uh, I'm based in Sweden and we are part of the European Union, but I will start with uh, uh, the Swedish rules, what, what um, um, our parliament decides here. Uh, luckily they are rather uniform uh, in the country anyway. Uh, so uh, there are of course more rules than this, but I thought it could be interesting to know that building permit may not be necessary if the turbine has a rotor diameter of max three meters and a total height of maximum 20 meters. Uh, However, even if you don't require a building permit, there are some requirements still. Uh, so noise requirements at neighbor must in any case be fulfilled. Otherwise you, you can be forced to take down the turbine um, afterwards. And um, there is a full list of requirements uh, in Swedish on uh, the website, uh, which I provided a link to here. Um, so if you want to, um, build a larger turbine, uh, you will always need uh, a building permit, unless possibly you are going to place it on a ship or something where rules for building permits don't 
apply. Um, and um, uh, the, the rules for building permits um, are not uh, decided on a European level. So uh, at least every country in Europe will have different rules. And I don't know the rules of, of the other countries in Europe. Um, so um, I, I think what I explained uh, really only applies to about 10 million people in Sweden. Uh, but I should also say that there are, of course, other requirements that must be fulfilled if a turbine will be connected to the grid. Uh, so for the grid connection, uh, contact the local utility first. We call them netbolag. Here, the energy delivery is separate from uh, the grid connection. So what we call netbolag, they handle the grid connection. Uh, but um, these things, I think, are not so problematic, even if you need a building permit that uh, can be achieved. And I should also say that under some circumstances, it is needed for turbines with less than three meters diameter or lower height. Also, it could depend on how close you put it to the um, um, border of the property, for example. Uh, but what is more complicated, uh, as I see it, are the regulations for turbines to be legal uh, to sell. And uh, this, I uh, wrote, applies in most of Europe. Uh, as you know, the UK has now left the European Union. Um, some other European countries uh, have never been part of it, so like um, Russia, which is you know, partially in Europe. Um, but uh, what, what, what I state here, it, it applies at least to all the EU countries and also to some other countries like Norway, which have agreements with the European Union. However, Norway is a special case. They, they have at least one part of Norway where this doesn't apply. It's uh, Svalbard, uh, Spitsbergen, I think it's also called. So if you if you would be able to convince a, uh, an ice bear to, to buy a wind turbine up there, a, um, you can avoid the, the European regulations. Uh, but here, <laughs> where I am, equipment must be CMarked. marked. It must be delivered with a declaration of conformity. And um, uh, this is basically a self-declaration. So, um, it doesn't have the costs which we saw Mike Burgi uh, present. Um, of course, the uh, manufacturer is um, supposed to do this either, uh, you know, on their own or or with the help help of a consultant or someone. So there will be some costs, but uh, uh, they can uh, be smaller. And and uh, in any case, you you. Um, uh, you're um, just responsible to do that, uh, you know, on your own. You're not required to, to hire anyone else. But uh, you need to state the name and address of a responsible person in Europe who is authorized to compile this technical documentation. So if something is imported uh, into this part of Europe uh, from uh, outside, um, you still need this documentation to be available here. And now suddenly the UK is outside of, of, um, of this area of Europe. So um, I don't know how they will handle that. Um, and um, this uh, technical file uh, would normally just be uh, uh, on the bookshelf or maybe in a safe uh, at at the manufacturer or, or importer or this responsible person in Europe. But in case of, of um, for example, an accident, uh, you need to show this to the authorities. Maybe you will need to present it in court. So I think this is a complication. Normally, uh, no authority will ask you for it, but uh, it, it could be so that you, you uh, as, uh, would uh, perhaps even need to go to prison if you 
cannot present it, say, after an accident has taken place. Uh, and if I continue here, um, what, what, what you need to show um, is not just to, to fulfill the international small wind turbine standard. Uh, it used to be listed as a harmonized standard in Europe, but it is no longer listed, uh, as I understand. And um, harmonization in, in this context, as I understand it, means uh, the, the European bureaucrats don't think it's harmonized with the other European uh, regulations, uh, like the machinery directive, that is one of them. And uh, that's why I understand that the manufacturer or importer to Europe must explicitly show that the machinery directive is fulfilled. Um, because that, that's um, um, required. Uh, and um, then it's not sufficient just to show it fulfills the standard. And uh, a key issue regarding the machinery directive uh, is what I right here in the lower part of the slide. The machinery must be fitted with a control device whereby the machinery can be brought safely to a complete stop. Uh, that is more strict than the IEC standard. And uh, um, from my experience, this uh, in reality probably makes many of the wind turbines sold here illegal. Uh, but um, little is done about it. Uh, that was all I had. Uh, and welcome to uh, discuss what I presented or, or get in touch later if uh, you would like to get back after the uh, workshop. Thank you, Sven. And uh, I have a, a brief question uh, before we go to the question from... Uh, from uh, Joseph Simon, that is, uh, have a question in, in the chat. Uh, I mean, since the, the, the building permits in Sweden are, let's say, more, more flexible, or at least if you have three less than three meters diameter, so how successful has been this? I mean, it, it is a problem for, for, for people to, what, I know the main problem in Sweden might be the electricity price is too low. So to compete with the small wind turbine is maybe difficult if you don't have any incentive. But uh, in terms of building permits, it, it, do you know if it's a problem or 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 is nobody really is complaining about the the, the situation of the building permits in Sweden? Um, I, I think the general problem for small wind is that uh, there are uh, big incentives for solar, no incentives for small wind, and. Uh, um, cheap electricity, so so the, the market is very small. And uh, um, actually, what what uh, what I presented about the building permit, I think that's a minor issue. But but of course, for some, if they if they don't know how to apply for a building permit, then then of course it's easier if it's uh, if it's below the limits they wrote. Yeah. I, and in the case of medium wind, let's say over twenty five kilowatt machines that are. Yeah. They, they for sure need a building permit in Sweden. So uh, do, do, you, do, you, do you know that there are many installations on that side in Sweden? Because maybe, I mean, you will get better, of course, yeah. better electricity price, but... Yes, uh, I mean, that, 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 is, um, that is the main part of the wind business. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, I, perhaps I should also explain that the people who work in the municipalities handling this, the building permits, um, I think all of them have been trained, you know, mainly to handle the applications for large wind. And if you're going to build a large wind farm, the permitting process is complicated. So, so basically they will uh, often think that they, they would apply the same rules for all sizes of wind turbines. Um, so, so I think that can be a complication because if, if, you, if you go above this limit, maybe someone at the municipality will say, oh yes, for wind turbines, we know we need to uh, have uh, you know, the investigations regarding sound, regarding wildlife, <laughs> yeah. uh, everything that's presented when you're going to build a wind farm. 
that it's, it can be just because it's 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 what they have learned is required for wind turbines and the person who taught them that didn't make any uh, distinction between <laughs> four megawatt machines and four kilowatt machines yeah yeah no and, and you have in the region you have several medium wind size manufacturers norway denmark that they can see like as a local market i mean like sweden norway denmark you know that you should try maybe to 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 find some kind of regulation that kind of benefit them to or make everything easier for them to to work on, the, on there because the, i mean they're from there but yeah so i would like to now to to move to the question from joseph simon uh, joseph uh, do you i will open your microphone in case you want to make your question yourself otherwise i will just read it so you should be able to unmute yourself hello my question is about the kind of wind turbine, uh, vertical, the standard or uh, horizontal, uh, um, what about your uh, opinion? Is it, what kind of them are the best for energy produce? Uh, well, uh, if, if you just ask uh, for my opinion, uh, my, my experience is that the, the traditional um, horizontal axis machines are more more efficient, um, and um, th there is, of course, more to say about that. But to keep it short, I, I will stop there and, and say that from the regulations, however, which is the focus here, uh, it will be treated the same way. Uh, so in Sweden, actually, they would define the. Um, rotor diameter for a vertical axis machine <laughs> um, the, in the way I wrote. So <laughs> perhaps an opportunity for the vertical axis manufacturers would be to make a machine which has three meter rotor diameter and 15 meter height. Then they could squeeze in more sweat area below this limit, but I don't know if it would make sense anyway because of the lower efficiency. Yeah, and I, 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 I should add maybe also uh, I have seen some, some regulations, especially in the U.S. in different areas. And uh, what you see is that they don't difference. I mean, the only differentiation they make sometimes between the two is the how the height, not because some use the, the rotor diameter, but in the case of vertical axis, they just use the, the top of the turbine. But in general, what I see is that the what what I can conclude from what I've seen is that the, the the policymakers they don't they don't understand very much about the difference between the two, so there's nothing in the regulation that differentiate them. In case especially for for mounted uh, rooftop uh, two right? some of them have this special mention of rooftop a uh, rooftop and they don't say basically and there is no regulation basically, they just mention that they cannot be for example ten feet higher than, I mean, they can be up to 10 feet higher of the rooftop, let's say more, they can only add 10 feet more, but there is nothing more. So that's also an opportunity maybe for, from, if, if we prepare the guidelines so that the policymakers can also kind of pro or help the consumer uh, to, to, to understand more about you know, what can be, what can you produce if you are rooftop or, or if you are, I mean, the, the, the regulation can also protect the consumer against putting the turbine in a wrong place or in the wrong direct wind direction, something like this, no? So I think it's also a good opportunity for when we talk about vertical access. But if you want to add something, Mike, about the vertical access in the US, Um, well, I mean, most of the turbines sold are are, are horizontal axis uh, conventional designs. Um, there are, have been hundreds of vertical axis companies come and go. Um, it's the area with the most um, con artists or, or cheats um, because uh, people like the looks of them. Uh, and so uh, companies come in and, and over promise energy production and sell a few units and then go out of business. So I would just I would caution, um, it, it's always important with, with any product like this to check the track, track record. Um, you don't want to be the first and you want to make sure that other people have had a successful history with it. Yeah. 
thank you. So I would like now to move to, to Germany so we can uh, discuss more at the end. So Patrick, I will invite you now to, to, to open your microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, okay, well in Germany, um, I just uh, calculated the new feed-in tariff <laughs> for uh, 2021. Um, for small wind turbines, it's uh, eight cent per kilowatt hours, so it's 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 very low. It always has been very low. And uh, um, but on the other hand, in, in Germany we have very high ele electricity prices. It's for consumer about thirty cent uh, euro cent per kilowatt hour, and welcome for well, commercial prices are around twenty cent. So. Um, this is the incentive for the turbine owner. This is the own consumption of the electricity. So feed in eight cents, not economical, economical but the, the own consumption. And um, we do not have like in the United States, tax credits or subsidies in, in, in any kind. So we also do not have a, a certification standard for small wind turbines like we are in the United States. So uh, we don't have this quality control. Um, there's no incentive for the manufacturers to to produce good quality and to certify the the the, the, the machines, and um, yeah, well, so and like uh, Mike just said, there's also bad quality in in the market. Um, there are you know, well very good uh, uh, turbines, but also um, turbines uh, with with uh, low quality. And I think the the main problem in Germany is is uh, the building permit. So, uh, well, at the moment we have a kind of disconnect in Germany, I guess in, in society and also in, at the political level, there's a lot of talk about climate uh, protection, also local climate protection. But if you look at the practice on the local level, then you see that a small wind turbine is often rejected by the authority. And, um, there are very large differences um, in the granting of building permits in the various local authorities. So Germany is comprised of 16 states like Bavaria, Saxony and, and so on. And the state law um, is uh, the one that uh, controls the, 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 the building permit. And we have a maximum height of 50 meter. So if you have a wind turbine uh, um, lower than 50 meter, it's a small wind turbine you can uh, put close to a building. And we have, um, in lots of states, we have um, the height of 10 meters. Um, so if you have a maximum height of 10 meters, then you can um, install the wind turbine without a permit. In, for instance, in Bavaria, uh, you can do this even in residential areas. Huh? Um, so this sounds quite open-minded, let's put it that way. But in the end, what is absolutely uh, or critical is the um, well, the, the people, the local, the people in the local authorities um, who grant the turbine or reject it. And this is this is the, the, the crucial part. Um, you know, there's there's even yeah, kind of people that they in, in the local authorities they don't know small wind term, turbines that are there insecure. Um, uh, sometimes you have people also in the authorities uh, which are opposed to wind turbines in principle, and for them large and small wind turbines are the same, and uh, they do not know that small wind turbines do not do not have a visual impact. Uh, on the landscape, uh, like 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 the the, the big wind turbines. Um, well, after all, there's a huge um, uh, difference in the in the in the in the practice, you know, concerning small wind turbines. And this is the issue we have to have to 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 tackle, um, because uh, yeah, every local authority has its has its own practice. Uh. And Patrick, uh, you, you in, in our previous webinars, you presented about uh, what not to do when you install a small wind turbine. And, and I have seen here in Germany, in many places, uh, wind turbines that are installed in the, in the wrong, let's say, wrong places or yeah. you know, they are blocked by a tree or by a house. So it seems like the regulation sometimes, I mean, even 
I, I mean, the regulation is not helping, but it's also not helping the consumer to 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 protect somehow the consumer also against uh, this kind of installations, right? So, do you have any example in Germany, any state where where you can see more? I mean, more small wins style, and uh, so so we can look at the at the regulations there. So. Um, well, when when you look at the law, the, the building law, um, this is quite um, um, yeah, let's say open minded. So you, the the small wind turbines they are, they are not prohibited. Uh, it always depends on the local authority, on the people in within the local authority. They decide it. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's more like a well, psychological or emotional uh, uh, aspect, you know, if, if um, a small wind turbine is, is granted or, or not. Um, but what, what I think what, what, what could be helpful is um, if you, um, the, the, this, this height, like in Sweden, it's 20 meter, where you can install a turbine without permit. In Germany, it's 10 meters. If you differentiate it by, by the wind resource of the region, like in, in Northern Germany, we have lots of wind. And in Southern Germany, like in Bavaria, we have um, not that much wind. And when you install a, a wind turbine in Bavaria in 10 meters height, you don't have enough wind. So that's a bit critical. So you have to rise, you have to raise it up to 20 meter, like in, in Sweden. This would be very, very helpful. Uh, but in northern Germany, um, on the other hand, you have uh, strong winds uh, in the coastal areas. This 10 meter uh, height, 10 or 50 meter is sufficient. So I think that might, might be one idea just to differentiate the, the, the height uh, with regard to the, to the um, wind resources in the, in, the, in the single regions. Yeah, good. And uh, yeah, I, I remind every participant that if you want to participate also and to comment about your countries, uh, what is regulation, or if you have any good example, you feel free to to raise your hand or or write something in the chat. I have a question for Mike because your your new machine, uh, I think the 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 tower height is probably like 18 meters or it's more than 10 meters high, so that will basically, I mean, you don't have. It, the, the opportunities for you to make installations are reduced because m most residential areas you won't be able to install the turbine unless you have go for the special permit. So, how, how, I mean, in, in that case, uh, do you see as an opportunity to 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 kind of separate, for example, the regulations between what is residential, what is agricultural, or what is commercial? Because in in, in most of the regulations that I have seen, they don't they don't separate uh, this. But I found one in one county in Illinois that they they actually say that in commercial and agricultural areas they are free to install. I mean there are, there are basically no limitations and the height it goes to I don't know 300 feet or something like this. So so this difference between what is residential, what is agricultural, or, or the, do you think it makes sense, especially now that you have a machine that goes over this limit. Well, I mean, we've had this problem all along because you you can't um, get a, a wind turbine to operate um, effectively with a 10 meter height um, or 35 foot height. Um, we had a, a major company that thought they could get away with that. They had an excellent turbine, but they put them on such short towers that the turbines didn't perform and the company went out of business and the investors lost a lot of money. So, um, uh, the zoning jurisdictions have different height limits for different types of zones. So residential, agricultural, industrial, commercial, and typically residential is the most restrictive. Um, but the, what I see happening in the future is if we, if we make, make the economics work, then there will be public pressure to loosen the restrictive uh, regulations that can't be technically justified. Um, and you really need that kind of a public push. So the, so the re regulators need to hear from their citizens, their constituents, that they, they want these, these turbines, they want them at the proper heights, they, they want reasonable regulations. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think the trade associations can help, um, and, and, but ultimately we're going to have to have such a strong economic uh, valuation from the customers that there's public pressure to um, at, at different levels uh, 
cities, counties, states, and even one day federal to, to loosen up the regulations. What do you think, in, according to your experience in the, in the U.S., what, what do you think is the main reason the policymaker will use to support that this 10 meters high? Is it a safety reason or is there any other reason? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I happen to know about this. In the U.S., of course, it's, I'm sure it's the same everywhere. Uh, uh, when a, a, a city or county needs a, a regulation, they copy one from someone else. Yeah. The easy path of least resistance. Well, starting uh, over a hundred years ago, um, cities instituted a 35 foot height restriction because that's how high they could pump water and fight fires. So you didn't want to build a structure that was higher than 35 feet because you couldn't put out a fire. Well, the, for a hundred and for 99 years, the reason why that's in there has been lost. But because it's in there, it gets copied and copied and copied and copied. Uh, and so it's, uh, uh, it's come back to bite us in the ass, but it wasn't because they didn't like the looks of wind turbines. It happened long before that. Okay. Yeah, so it's a good, uh, good thing to know that. So we know how to fight that. <laughs> Maybe if we try to find a way to fight that. Yeah. So, yeah, I've seen that the 10 meters high in many countries is kind of copy and uh, uh, I'm trying to look for, for explanation on or how to, to, to deal with that. But there are also many, many, many other things like the distances or the noise. And uh, I, have in, in, I have checked few uh, regulations in Illinois in some areas that are more or less uh, close. And I have seen that the noise levels are the, the basically one use 50, one use 55, one use 60, 165. So, There is no, I mean, and one of them is 50 and it's really, I mean, it, there's no clear, I mean, path to know why they do that. I mean, so what do you recommend in terms of, of noise? What, what the regulation should, should be? I mean, especially if you are a, a certified machine, so you know already what is your noise level. Well, how do how you think it should be written? Uh, in, oh. in the, So a very common way in which those clauses are written is to, is to make a requirement at the edge of the owner's property. We always try to, to make it at the closest inhabited dwelling. So, you know, if your neighbor is a mile away, why judge the wind turbine at the property boundary uh, of, the, of the system owner? Um, the other thing that we try to uh, encourage is the um, uh, adoption of a, 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 to an allowance for storms and power outages. These are the conditions under which the wind turbines make the most noise, but they don't happen very often. And if you, if you, if you sort of do a comparison, as, as I've done, um, the amount of time that your neighbor is running their lawnmower and making a hell of a racket, Is, is, is less than the amount of time that you have high winds uh, in, in most areas. So um, in, in the ordinances that we've helped to, to write, uh, we put in those ex exclusions. Uh, you're exempted from the restriction, um, the noise restriction during periods of, of high wind or power outages. And, you, and the, the readings are taken at the closest inhabited dwelling. Um, rather than the property line. Good. Uh, uh, Sven, do you have a comment on, on the height? Uh, yes, uh, I, I just wrote a little about this in the chat uh, because I, I, I have come across a, a motivation for our 20 meter Uh, limit and and that's uh, aviation risks and and I, I understand it specifically for uh, low flying helicopters. Uh, so there are actually areas in Sweden where the military uh, will not allow any structure with more than 20 meter height. And uh, and if you want to put up something that is higher, uh, they definitely want to know about it. Um, I happen to know a wind project developer who, who didn't say they put up a, a tall wind met mast and um, when the military found out they were really upset uh, and, and uh, 
uh, helicopters sometimes have a reason to, to fly low when they uh, cert certain um, medical um, assignments, for example, um, are flown at really low height. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there can be justification sometimes yeah. for, for these limits. Good. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm wondering, for example, in cases like in northern part of Germany, uh, where you have you are full of wind farms and then have a limitation of 10 meters high for small wind uh, where you can have around you very tall big turbines. It doesn't make sense at all in my, I mean, my opinion. No? Also, sometimes you see they're very close to the house. So it's when you go to Husum, if you have been in Husum in, in the fair and you see the small wind turbines there, they're really, really close to the house when they have an open field there. So it's probably a regulation that, you know, it's restricting you how far you can put the turbine from the house, something like this. But Really, so yeah, I put my email in the chat uh, for for everybody. If you have any examples, it doesn't matter which language, uh, but policies or regulations in your countries or your regions, please feel free to send it to me. I will have a look and try to 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 condensate all the information I, I will get from from you, uh, and try to to prepare a draft or, or start preparing something so we can meet again in the in the in the future in the near future in a more more kind of a workshop than this one. Uh, so if you have any final comment, please uh, write in the chat or, or raise your hand. I will, I won't, I don't want to take more time from, from you in this meeting. For sure we will have a, another meeting in the, another workshop in the very near one about regulations with them kind of a draft or more content about, uh, about this topic. But then we will have another but about another one about policy or incentive policies. So we have to discuss uh, fee and tariff, and we have to discuss net metering, tax credits, all this stuff. So we can have also a set of, uh, let's say guidelines about this. So if anybody, because we know that in, in some countries they have been uh, taking information from us, from the association regarding, for example, cost of small wind turbines. I remember in, in one country, uh, policymakers, they, they took as a reference uh, a small wind report where we put the cost from the U.S. and they decided to use the same, this cost for setting up the free tariff in the country. So, and then we have to send a letter to explain that the U.S. was a very mature market. So if you, if you, are, if you are just starting, you can reduce this cost because nobody will be able to, to meet that. So we, as we know that, and we know many policymakers they look for information, so we have to be able to provide some um, very, very, very well explained information about how to design these policies or regulations. So that's the, that's the idea. So I have a comment here from Joseph Simon, Simon, 10 meter only small wind tower, normal up to 200, yes. Yeah, so in Germany, also in the South. So in general, in Germany, you have also this limitation of 10 meter high, and it doesn't matter which size is your turbine. I mean, if it's small, of course, but uh, yeah, it doesn't, I mean, my opinion doesn't make sense. So uh, I will finish now the meeting and John, uh, yes, Mike. John, yeah, I just want to make a very quick comment for those who are not, um, do not already know about this. If you want to, uh, the Bible on small wind and uh, all aspects, including zoning, go find the books from Paul Guy. I know he's on the call and uh, he's a good longtime friend of mine but he has written, these are 300, 400 page books and you'll, you'll get so much information that's useful. Uh, that's a, uh, everyone should have that book on their, on their bookshelves or his books on their bookshelves. I mean, yes. Let me just show the book. This is yeah. one of Paul Guy's standard books. Huh? Paul, great to have you here indeed. And I can just recommend it. It is, this is one of those Bibles. Yes. So if there is no final comment, uh, then I will, you will receive uh, in the near future an invitation for another meeting. Uh, it will be probably a bit longer and it will be more uh, uh, a workshop than this one. Uh, we will try to, to have something very well prepared for that meeting and, and hopefully also a draft, kind of a draft of several of these topics we talked today about uh, how you should look like. And, uh, and yeah, if you have any comment or any other information, please send me an email 
uh, to my email that is in the chat there. And now, yeah, for the uh, closing, I will invite Stefan. And Mike, do you want to say something? I think Mike is mute. Mike, you're muted. So to unmute. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I remembered now that Sven has a new book. And so I want yeah. to give him some time as well. Very good. Very good. So I think we have really excellent experts here. There's no doubt. I'm very grateful for the, for to our presenters, uh, really um, very knowledgeable people who know things also from the ground. Thank you so much for this, I think, very um, lively discussion and uh, it was very good to listen to you. Um, thank you also to the audience. And let me at the end say, of course, should also do some advertisement for the association. Uh, we are, um, of course, as an association, we present these webinars for free. We're very happy. If you're interested in this topic, working on it on the longer term, you're welcome to join us as a member. We're always pleased to welcome new members, especially in that area of small wind. And of course, now starting again the new year with the webinars, we have a, a, a range of sponsorship options for this as well. So we're very happy to work with you on a permanent basis. Thank you from my side. Have a good day, have a good evening, wherever you are, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye, thank you. <laughs>